Well, good evening. Glad to see you all out tonight. We're excited to have the Bob Jones uni- Hello. Uh, have the Bob Jones University music team with us. And uh, they told me all their names, but I'm old and I forgot. So uh, we'll let them introduce themselves. And uh, without further ado, the Bob Jones music team. ourselves really quickly before we start our program. We are from Bob Jones University. It's a Christian college down in Greenville, South Carolina. My name is John Pate, and this is my wife, Abby, at the piano. And Abby just recently graduated with her bachelor's degree in women's ministries, and I with my master's in Bible. And Abby and I would love to one day work in a local church setting here in the States. I'd love to be a pastor or assistant pastor, something like that. I'm going to have the team introduce each other now. Good evening. I'd like to introduce Taylor Bancroft. Taylor is from Florida, and he just recently graduated with his undergrad in church music with a voice principal. Taylor would love to one day serve as a music pastor here in the States, and we are very excited to have him on the team this summer. This is my friend David Eilert. He is from Michigan, and David is going to be a senior music education major this coming fall, and he will be a senior. David is one day hoping he'll be able to go overseas and teach in a school there. And this is Sarah Irvin, and she's from way out in Colorado. And although obviously she'd make a great music major, she's actually a communications disorder major, which means she's studying to maybe be a speech therapist or something like that and help people overcome some of their communication difficulties in the future. And this is Amanda Bright. Amanda is originally from Sellersville, Pennsylvania, which is about 45 minutes away from here. And but now she lives in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, she's studying music education with a voice emphasis, and she'll be a junior next year. Um, she really loves to travel. Last summer, she had the opportunity to go to China and teach English as a second language to the students there for about six weeks. And once again, it is a blessing to be with you. We hope that tonight we can encourage you, that we can direct your attention toward Jesus Christ, because 
He's the reason that any of us are here tonight. He is the reason that we can be called His children, that we can be saved. And the song we just sang, I Will Sing of My Redeemer, talks about that, about our salvation. And the fact that one day, there was a radical change in our lives. Jesus brought us from death to life. He uh, allowed us to be a part of His family. His blood cleansed us from sin. And because of that, we are all so thankful. I'm sure you are thankful for that as well. But you know, often after our salvation, we can go through some pretty difficult times. We go through trials, we go through struggles and suffering. Um, and, and it's when we go through those times that our faith is tested and we can tend to question God. And sometimes we even ask if He knows what He's doing, if He's really in control. Well, tonight we'd like to share with you one major truth through testimony and song. And that is that God is a God of perfect wisdom. And everything God does is always right. It's always good. And so we can know that no matter where we are, no matter where He has placed us, that He is working in our lives to make us like Christ. And so because of that, we can trust Him. And not only can we trust Him, but we can glory even in the middle of very difficult circumstances because we know He is our Redeemer and because we know He is a God of perfect wisdom and we can glory in our Savior's name. to be here tonight and to share with you how the Lord has been recently working in my heart. When I first went to school at BJ, I was very excited because there's just a, whole, a lot of different new opportunities that happen. You have new classes, you have new roommates, just a new phase in life. And uh, my freshman year at school was going along really well until I reached a certain week in October when it seemed like everything was coming due. This week, I can remember, I had a huge biology test, I had a big speech that I needed to give, I had an English paper, and many other quizzes that just made this one particular week very challenging. And so as I was, as I was preparing for my week, I really wanted to do well in everything so that my parents would be pleased and that my teachers would be able to, to say, you know, you've done a great job. And so I was just really focused 
on doing my best in everything. And one afternoon during that week, I walked into my room and I found a note on my bed. And it was from a friend in my society. And this friend had already been a huge encouragement to me up until that point in the semester. And so before I even picked up um, Abby's note, I thought, I, I know what's going to be on this card. It's going to be something like Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And this was just going to be Abby's encouragement that um, this week was go go going to go well and that I could, I could do it. And so when I picked up the card, I was very surprised to read Philippians 3.8, which says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And when I first read Philippians 3.8, I honestly did not understand why Abby had given me that verse, or why it applied to, or how it applied to my week at all. But I'm so thankful that the Lord prompted Abby to give me Philippians 3.8, because that verse is exactly what I needed. You see, I was living for the praise of man, honestly, through in the fact that I wanted everyone to tell me that I had done a good job, but I was missing the opportunity to know my God better. I wasn't able to say with Paul that I counted all things but loss, save for the excellency of the knowledge of my God. But I'm so thankful that the Lord is gracious and loving and showing me my pride and my self-sufficiency and the fact that my priorities were misguided. And this is something that the Lord is continuing to teach me. It's a daily surrender. But I'm so thankful that we as rebellious sinners, when we come to Christ, we can know Him and we can spend a lifetime pursuing God. That is the highest privilege we could ever have. And so I'm going to play for you now the hymn, Be Thou My Vision. I'm going to ask Amanda to join me in the middle of the hymn as we testify that man's empty praise and the riches of this world are nothing compared to knowing God.
my name is Amanda Bright, and the Lord has been teaching me that I need to trust Him even more than I already am. Two days before I left to come on this trip, I got a phone call from my dad saying that my 19-year-old cousin had run away from home. She had gotten on a plane and uh, flew to the Ukraine to get married to her boyfriend. And the first thing that hit me on that drive home was fear, worry, anxiety, and uncontrollable sadness. I couldn't believe that my cousin had chosen to run away from her home country, her family, and her God. But the second thing that hit me was, okay God, we have two days to get this figured out before I leave to travel. But two days came and went, and my cousin still wasn't home. And that's when the Lord really started to work in, t in my heart. He began to use the, so the songs that we sing and the testimonies that my friends give and the words that they have been given by God to impact my life. And they really all said one common theme. That's what they stuck out to me. And that was trusting that God has the perfect wisdom and he has the wisdom to put together a perfect plan for our lives. And that perfect plan if we are Christians, is to make us more like himself. And on that perfect plan, God didn't promise in his word that everything was going to be easy. There are trials that come into our lives that are really hard. But he has promised in his word that if we come to him as humble servants, willing and ready to be molded and used by him, that he'll show us the way and he'll give us the strength to get through those trials. So I need to remember when those times come that I need to trust that God has a perfect plan and then that plan is to make me more like himself.
At this time, I want to talk to you a little bit about Bob Jones University and what God has been doing there, both in our lives and in the lives of the student body there. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this school, but it is so exciting to be a part of what God has been doing down in Greenville, South Carolina at BJU, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that. At BJU, our biggest desire is to grow and make disciples so that each student can go out into all the world like Jesus commanded us to and make disciples, assist local churches in making disciples. And we seek to do that through a liberal arts education. We seek to help each student to grow them and disciple them so that they can be ready through a liberal arts education. A liberal arts education is an education that seeks to educate the whole person and not just a specific area of his or her life. And so we want to make sure that at BJU, we have each, each student is founded firmly in the Word of God. And we have three major themes. You'll see them up here when you, if you visit our display. Build faith, challenge potential, and follow Christ. First of all, we want to build our faith on God's Word. We believe in the life-changing power of the Word of God. And so we want to remain faithful to God's Word in everything we do. We want to make sure that students know the Word, that they are well grounded in the Word of God so that they can go out and teach other people um, through their lives and through their words. And at BJU, one thing that we do that has made a big, big impact on a lot of students is every class, no matter what class, it may be chemistry or apologetics or criminal justice or a nursing class, each class is taught from a biblical worldview. We teach each class against the backdrop of God's Word. Also, students will hear a lot of preaching. Um, each week, we meet four times a week for chapel, and students will hear God's Word preached at that time. And I still remember messages that God used in my life to really change me, to challenge me, to grow me, and He does the same thing in many other students' lives. Not only do we want to build our faith on God's Word, but we want to challenge our potential for Christ. We are an academic institution, and so we strive for excellence in everything we do so that we can bring glory to Jesus Christ. And so we strive for excellence in our academics, in our outreach opportunities, in our leadership development, and community service, local church involvement, things like that. And, and I know that each of these students could talk about the many ways that they've been stretched and challenged and pushed outside their comfort zone at BJU. There definitely are many weeks where you're not sure if you can get everything done, but that is excellent practice where God takes you and he, and he challenge you, challenges us and he pushes us, and it's at those times where God, where God really molds us um, at those difficult times. And I remember one semester in particular that was especially difficult. I was on an outreach opportunity to a local jail and my friends and I would go to this jail and we would witness to the inmates every Friday night. And I wasn't very good at sharing the gospel at that time. In fact, often I was fearful. I didn't know how to do it very well. And so those opportunities, going every Friday night, sharing the gospel to the inmates, really helped me and grew me. And, and after that semester, I felt like God had, had helped me to learn better how I could share my faith with unbelievers. And I'm so thankful for that. And then finally, we want to follow Christ. And following Christ doesn't stop when you graduate from college. If you're a Christian, we follow Christ for the rest of our lives. And so at BJU, we want to make sure we cultivate an atmosphere of discipleship so that each student can, can mentor each other and so that they can be mentored by the faculty and staff and the deans and things like that. And we are so thankful for the iron sharpening iron relationships that God has used. I'm so thankful for the relationships God's used in my life to change me. Um, in, in those ways. And so each student will meet with either his room or a group of rooms every evening, and they share prayer requests, they pray together, and they seek to disciple and encourage each other in the Lord, that life-touching life relationships. And God uses those in, in great ways to change students' lives. I think the thing that's probably made the biggest impact on students and on my life as well is the faculty and staff. God has given us an excellent team of caring and knowledgeable faculty and staff who aren't just concerned that they teach from the front of the classroom, but they teach with their lives. And they're not just passionate about the subjects they teach, they're passionate about seeing each student grow and change. And I remember one um, man in particular, a staff member, who one semester came alongside and started encouraging me to memorize and meditate on God's Word. And he and I started memorizing passages of Scripture together. 
And God used him in a great way in my life to grow me and to help me grow in the area of meditation on God's word. So today, if you are perhaps considering colleges, or maybe you know someone who is, maybe a, a son or daughter or a grandson or daughter, I would encourage you that no matter where God has called us, whether it's business or education or any other area of service, if we are believers, we are all called to full-time ministry. We're all called to make disciples. And so we want to make sure that we firmly ground our faith in God's word, that we challenge our potential for Christ, and that we follow him for the rest of our lives. And if you are in 7th through 12th grade here tonight, I want to encourage you to come right up here to the front right-hand corner at the end of the service, and we're going to meet with you, and we'd like to talk with you, uh, answer any questions you might have about BJU, and also we'll, we will be drawing for a t-shirt as well, so I don't want you to miss that. Please come right up right after the service, and we'd love to talk with you right afterwards. And for those of you who maybe are consider you would like some music to help be an encouragement to your family, we'll be selling some CDs up here at our display and they have been a big encouragement to my wife and me, and I'm sure they would be to your family as well. At this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Keith. Well, again, we want to thank Bob Jones University's music team for coming. Uh, it's been a beautiful concert so far, and uh, uh, the amazes me the, uh, the gift that God has given us through music. He's commanded us to sing to him, and even more amazingly, when we're in heaven, the Lord Jesus is going to sing to us. What an amazing event. The God who made music will sing to us in his joy over us, lost sinners. This time we're going to have an offering to encourage uh, this team that's uh, spending their summer in, in ministry. Um, so I would ask that uh, you consider their sacrifice and sacrifice as well. I'd ask the ushers if they would please come forward. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for this day that you've given us. Father, we thank thee for these young people who are seeking to serve thee with their, with their lives, their talents. Father, we pray that you would uh, encourage them, give them journey mercies. Father, that you would help them to edify believers and to reach the lost. Lord, we ask that you'll bless both gift and giver this night. In Jesus' name, amen.
things created by his hand and held together at his command. He knows the mysteries of the seas, the secrets of the stars are his. He guides the planets on their way and turns the earth through another day. said earlier, my name is David Eilert, and whenever we sing that song as a group, well, I play mostly, but sometimes sing, uh, the words just really minister to my heart that God really is a God of perfect wisdom, and He uses the circumstances in our life to accomplish His perfect will. And so that was, that's always such an encouragement to me. And so I just want to share bl briefly with you all some, some things that He's been teaching me over the past year. And it started um, about a year ago when I was preparing for my junior music recital with my violin. And as a music major, this is, it's very important. So I really wanted to do well, and so I started practicing and working really hard, practicing tons of hours to get the music learned. And things were going really well until about <clears throat> three or four weeks before the recital, when my teacher thought it would be best if I learned a different section of music that was actually a lot more difficult, a lot harder. And so... I didn't, under, I didn't understand the reasoning behind that, and I didn't know if I could work it up in time for the recital. But I, I practiced it a lot. I practiced a ton of extra hours on it. And thankfully, I was able to get the notes learned. But unfortunately, in the process of all those extra hours of practice, I developed an injury in my left arm, which is very important when playing the violin. And so it got, it got so bad and so painful that I wasn't actually able to play my violin for more than five or ten minutes at a time right before my recital, a couple days before. And so I was, I was stressing out about this. I was worrying about how I was going to get through the recital, and I was questioning God. I was, I was asking Him, you know, why would you allow this injury to happen right before my junior recital? You know how important this is. But He directed my attention to a passage that I'm sure all of us are familiar with in Philippians chapter 4, where it's talking about bringing our requests before Him with prayers and petitions. And uh, trust me, I was doing that. I was praying about this recital and about this injury. But at the end of verse 6 of that chapter, where it says, With thanksgiving, that part just really stuck out to me. It convicted me that I was not being grateful, that I wasn't being thankful for the circumstances that God had given me, even though I didn't understand them, even though I didn't agree with them, I didn't like them. But... Um, he just worked on my heart and finally got me to a point where I said, Okay, God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to 
give thanks for this injury. And when I did that, it's amazing. Just like verse 7 of the same chapter says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And it's amazing that when God got my heart to a place where I could give thanks for even the injury, He gave me that perfect peace right before my recital. And so, <clears throat> he, that, was, that was an incredible blessing. And He blessed the recital. It went... Well, I, I survived, and I made it out alive. And, but the important thing is that I learned that no matter what the circumstances are that God gives us, that I need to give thanks, that I need to be grateful for them. And so I'm going to play for you a song called, Lord, I Need You. I don't know if you're familiar with the words or not, but they, basically it's a prayer that no matter what the circumstances are, whether they're ones that we agree with or ones that we don't quite understand, that... We need the Lord. And so I hope that that is my prayer in the future. That no matter what the circumstances are, that Lord, I need you. Good evening. Again, my name is Taylor Bancroft. And a moment ago, we just sang about how God, in his perfect wisdom, is designing a tapestry of grace from our lives. Now, this tapestry is filled with strands of good times and bad. But often, in those difficult times, we don't trust God because we think our plan is better than his. Growing up, every single time I tried to talk to my grandfather about spiritual things, I was immediately shut down. 
and to become very hostile towards me. So when I found out that I could use my senior voice recital as a chance to share the gospel with my grandfather, I was really excited because over the years I had learned that when I sang about God, that grandpa would listen. So I started praying that God would show me the perfect songs that would logically show my grandfather man's sinful condition, Christ's love displayed through his death on the cross, and then how we as Christians should live because of Christ's love. But then in October, I got a phone call from my, gran my dad, and my grandfather had gone to the hospital, was having trouble breathing, and after a series of tests, we found out that he was diagnosed with lung cancer, and the doctors didn't expect him to live long. So we started praying that God would first heal my grandfather with cancer, and then secondly, allow him to come to my recital so that he could get saved. But God had a different plan. My grandfather ended up passing away on February 1st, just three weeks before my recital as an unsaved man. I didn't understand why God would allow me to put so much time and energy into trying to share the love of God with my grandfather for me really never being able to have a chance to do that. So I started praying that God would change my thinking and show me his plan because I didn't understand what God was doing. God did that through many passages, one passage being the story of the rich man and Lazarus, where God reminded me that I had other unsaved friends and family members who needed to hear about the love of God, and that I may be the only one who had a chance to share that with them. So I started praying that God would bring someone to my recital who needed to hear the truth of Jesus Christ. And God did that. My brother ended up coming very unexpectedly. And afterwards, he came up to me and told me that God had used the truth and the love found in the songs that I sang to open my brother's heart back up to God. My brother had been away from God for about two years and had been outside of church for a long time. And today, because of the work that Christ has done in his heart, he's a totally different person. I had a plan for my recital, a plan that would bring my brother, or my grandfather, to a saving knowledge of God. But God had a different plan, a plan that would bring my brother back to fellowship with him. Sometimes in life, we're either in the midst of a difficult circumstance or about to go through one. And whether for you it's a busy week that turns your focus from God, like Sarah, or a painful injury, like David, or a family crisis, like Amanda and I. God's plan, his will, is always higher and more perfect than anything we could ever imagine. faith when we can't see, learning to trust and obey, leaning on arms everlasting, sheltered by wings from above, holding to treasures eternal, assured of God's infinite love. He has a plan that is higher than our plan, a love that he always will show. He gently leads as he guides us by his hand, gives us peace beyond all that we know. We have the promise of life everlasting, conceived long before time began. We have the joy of a family forever, all because of the blood of the Lamb, all because of the blood of the Lamb. In shady green pastures we've rested, Beside the still waters he's led, 
And there have been mountains and valleys And dry desert days that we tread Yet the Lord, he has always been faithful Tenderly leads us each day Jesus, the kind, gentle shepherd Shows us that he is the way For he has a plan that is higher than our plan A love that he always will show He gently leads as he guides us by his hand Gives us peace beyond all that we know we have the promise of life everlasting, conceived long before time began. We have the joy of a family forever, all because of the blood of the Lamb, all because of the blood of the Lamb. He has a plan that is higher than our plan, a love that he always will show. He gently leads as he guides us by his hand, gives us peace beyond all that we know. We have the promise of life everlasting, conceived long before time began. We have the joy of a family forever, all because of the blood of the Lamb, all because of the blood of the Open your Bible tonight to Psalm 23. We'll look briefly at this very well-known psalm. Psalm 23. As most of you know, Psalm 23 was written by David. And David is well known for writing psalms while enduring very difficult trials. And when he would endure a trial, he would write down a psalm, but often the psalms that he writes and the things that he says are very different from the kinds of things that we say in trials. And I want you to think for a second, if, let's say, when you go through a trial, if you were to write down a psalm, let's say you were to write down just what your heart wants to say to God, what would you look to? What would be the things that you would write about in your psalm? Let's look at what David writes about in Psalm 23, because Psalm 23, like the other Psalms, is dealing with a difficult trial. David is in the middle of a difficult circumstance, and so what does he look to? As you read silently, and I read out loud, look at what are the things that David looks at in this Psalm. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
Back in the fall of 2011, a young man named Matt Templeton was a soldier in Afghanistan, and he was a Christian. And Matt's mission, his main job, he would lead a troop, he would lead a group of men, and they would go and they would dis, um, they would get rid of enemy mines. They would go go in and they would find mines and they would they would clear them out. And they had gotten pretty good at their job. And so one morning, they, they were about to, to leave on their mission. And Matt prayed, like he always did with his group, that God would give them safety that day. And as they went on their day, um, all of a sudden, they incurred some enemy fire from a nearby town. And they started to run and started to call to each other on their radios, trying to find a place where they could meet up, when all of a sudden, a rocket landed just to the right and behind Matt and sent shrapnel all throughout his body. And he fell down, and after a few seconds of intense pain, he passed out. And Matt woke up a few days later in a hospital in Germany. And as he lay flat on his back, staring at the ceiling, he realized that his life had changed drastically. And the fear and the, the, the difficulties he faced on the battlefield could not compare to the temptation he faced at this moment, staring at the ceiling, and for many days to come as he faced surgery after surgery after surgery to remove the shrapnel. You see, as Matt lay there, he was tempted to do one thing, and that was worry. Now you might be thinking, well, how could someone in that circumstance not worry? You might be thinking, I've worried about a lot of things that are a lot smaller than Matt's problem. In fact, we all have difficulties. If you were to think sincerely about your life today, and you probably don't have to think hard, there is something in every one of our lives that is unpleasant to us. Some kind of suffering. And suffering doesn't have to be big. I heard someone define suffering as any circumstance where we have something we do not want, or we want something we do not have. Suffering is any circumstance where we have a circumstance or something which we don't want or we want a circumstance which we really don't have. And it could be that right now you have been placed in a difficult circumstance. Maybe a sickness. Maybe you've lost a loved one recently. Maybe you have a son or a daughter who is far away from the Lord and you pray every day and yet it seems like they get farther well, you know, in those kinds of circumstances, we all tend to worry. That's our natural response. Now, what is worry? Worry is really just meditation. It's sort of like a cow chewing its cud. It's thinking about the same thing again and again and again. It's like when you sit down and maybe you try to read your Bible. You say, Lord, speak to me. And you look at the page and all of a sudden the page becomes a blur. And what are you thinking about? You're thinking about that circumstance. And you think about it again and again all throughout your day. Or maybe you come in to hear God's word preached and you're looking at the preacher, and yet what is your mind doing? Your mind is going a thousand different directions. We all dwell on the circumstances of our lives. But what is it that we ought to dwell on? What is it that we ought to think about? Well, in Psalm 23, David gives us three things, and really one major thing that we ought to think about, and that is that God is our provider. We often think of Psalm 23 as the shepherd's psalm, and it is. But I think even the bigger theme of Psalm 23 is that the Lord provides everything you need. And because God provides everything you and I need, we must trust Him. In fact, we have to trust Him. Because He provides everything we need. Now what is it that God provides? Well, we see first of all in verses 1 through 3 that God provides His guidance. And because of that... You must trust him. Look at the first sentence. In verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. Let's stop there. Have you ever thought about what those words mean? Here's David. He knows who the Lord is. This is the word Yahweh, the God who brought Israel out of Egypt, through the wilderness, into the promised land. David has heard about this God all of his life, and he has seen him work. He knows about God. He knows that he is the God of Israel, the God who created the world. And yet, what does he call him? The Lord is my shepherd. The God who made the universe is David's personal shepherd. Isn't that amazing? And today, if you are a believer, the Lord is your 
personal shepherd as well. And we know what that word shepherd signifies. It doesn't mean that God just is is a God up in heaven. He is a God who cares for us, who guides us, who leads us. But what is the end result of God's guidance? It's found in the next sentence. I shall not want. So because the Lord is my shepherd, I will never lack anything. Because God is my shepherd, I have everything I need. So what does that mean? It means that wherever God leads you, wherever God places you, whatever circumstance you might be in today, it's not just a good circumstance. It's not just God's plan for you. It is the very best circumstance you could be in. In fact, it's the only circumstance you want to be in. Because God is a good shepherd, and because He guides you, everywhere He guides you is the perfect place for you. So it could be today that God has guided you in some very difficult places. Maybe you find yourself in a job which you really don't appreciate. And every day as you drive into work, you think, when will this end? When can I find a job that I actually like? And as you, as you stay there at work, perhaps eight hours or even more, it seems like those hours drag on and on because you can't stand it. And you say, God, I want to be out of this circumstance. I want to be somewhere else. Or maybe you don't have a job and you really would like one. And as you search, you go from, from opportunity to opportunity. And it seems like doors keep slamming in your face and your finances begin to dwindle. And it's in those circumstances that we can think, I don't know if God has placed me in the very best circumstance. And we look at our friends, and we look at those who maybe have more than we do, and we think, I wish I could be there. Have you ever thought thoughts like that? I know I have. But you know what? When we think thoughts like that, we are thinking very ungodly thoughts. Because in verse 1 of Psalm 23, God says that because He is our shepherd, everywhere He leads us is not just good, it's not just the right place, it is the perfect place. It is the only place where you can find everything that you need. And then we see in verse 2, He moves on to talk about how wherever God leads us, not, as, not only does He guide us, but wherever He guides us, He cares for us. Look at verse 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Here we have this, this wonderful picture of God, the God of the universe, guiding each one of us as His sheep. Now, are sheep smart? They're not. They're not very smart at all. I heard an illustration about a... Uh, it's a true story about some shepherds in Turkey who had thousands of sheep. And they, one morning, it was a Saturday morning, they decided they were going to go get a breakfast and they were going to leave their sheep shepherdless for just a short period of time. And they thought it'd be okay. Apparently they had not taken care of sheep much. And so when they came back later on in the morning, all of the sheep were running headlong off of a cliff and they were all following each other. Apparently what had happened was about mid-morning, one sheep had taken a step off that cliff and they all followed in right behind and um, several hundred of them died, sadly. But after several hundred of them had formed a sufficient pillow, this is a true story, they formed a sufficient pillow so that the hundreds that fell in on top actually survived the fall. So the shepherds were thankful for that. But you know what? That story just shows us that sheep are not very smart. And you know what? We don't like to admit it, but we're a lot like sheep. And we think we know where we ought to go. We think we know what's perfect for us. We say, if only I had this, if only I had that job, if only I had that salary, if only I had a wife, if only I had a husband, if only I could get back together with my boyfriend or girlfriend. We think, if only I had that circumstance, that would be perfect. That would be best for me. But wherever God guides us, and only where God guides us, is perfect for us. And wherever God guides us, He cares what about when we, like sheep, go astray? What about when we know that God is our shepherd and we turn our back on God, we say, God, I don't want your word. I don't want to gather together in this body of believers. I don't want to follow you anymore. I want to run from you. We run from the Lord. What does he do? Verse 3, he restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Praise the Lord that when we stray from Him, when we like sheep go astray, He finds us like the New Testament says. He leaves the ninety and nine and He finds us. And when He finds us, He brings us back to Him. 
And some people even say that shepherds would break the front legs of their sheep so that, and carry them for a long period of time so that that sheep would learn not to stray again. Praise the Lord that when we stray from Him, He is our good shepherd. When we doubt His plan, when we say, God, I don't want to be under Your sovereign hand, when we try to get out from under God's hand, He doesn't leave us. He doesn't let us ruin our lives. He seeks us out. Because He guides us, and everywhere He guides us is right and perfect. But what about when the places God guides us are very difficult and are actually dangerous? Well, in verse 4, David moves on to a different circumstance in his life. Look at verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For what? Look at the verse. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So how is it that David could know that even when he gets into a very difficult circumstance, that he would still be protected because the Lord was with him? So not only does God provide guidance, but God provides his protection. And because of that, you must trust him. Did you notice something about verse 4 that's very interesting? In verses 1 through 3, David has been talking in the third person. He says in verses 1 through 3, He maketh me lie down, He restoreth my soul, He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. And then in verse 4, all of a sudden, He hits this trial, and what does He say? Thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Often, it is the most difficult circumstances that cause us to turn to the Lord and to realize that He is with us. It's when God leads us through those valleys. It's when God takes us through those dark times. It's when God causes all of the things that were going well in our life to start going poorly. It's when God takes our schedule, which we thought was so perfect, and He turns it upside down. It's when God takes that salary that we were trusting in, and He takes it away. It's when God takes that relationship that we found security in, and it becomes strained. It's at those times that we turn to the Lord and say, Thou art with me. The Lord is with us. But not only is He with us, but verse 5, and in da here David switches from the picture of the shepherd and the sheep to all of a sudden the picture of a host. And he says the Lord is welcoming in, him into his, we could say, home and, and allowing David to be friends with the shepherd. Look at verse 5. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Here we see that not only does the Lord protect us with His presence, but the Lord protects us with His friendship. You see, the God of the universe, the God who made you, He wants to be your personal friend. He wants you to know Him. He wants you to walk with Him. And He brings us through difficult times so that we will know Him. I remember when I was a kid, one of my chores at night was to close the chicken coop. And it was pretty fun for me to take care of the chickens during the daytime, but at night, when it was pitch black, it could get pretty scary down there, at least for me as a little kid. And I wouldn't take a flashlight because I thought that that was dumb. I wanted to show that I could... I could um, go out there in the dark, and so I would walk down there, and, and I would get really scared, and I would walk really slowly, and one night in particular, I was already scared half to death, and then I heard a hiss, a very loud hiss in the woods beside me, and I knew what it was, it was a possum, and they would always hang around the chicken coop, apparently they thought the chickens were their responsibility as well. And they were up to no good. And I knew that possums really could not harm me. They, I, they, weren't, they can't run fast. And, uh, and I, I knew there was nothing to be afraid of. But I was afraid. And, and I knew, and when you look at a possum, they kind of, they open their mouth and they sort of smile at you, as some people say. And it looks like they're going to kill you. And so I, I saw that opossum and I, and I quickly turned and I ran as fast as I could back up to the house because I didn't care what happened to the chickens. I was going to get out of there alive. And so I went back up to the house and I told my dad and he took me down there and he walked down to the chicken coop with me. And you know, it didn't matter if the possum was still there. It didn't matter. No ma it didn't matter what was in the woods that night. When my dad was with me, it was a totally different experience. I had a totally different attitude. There was absolutely nothing to be afraid of. 
And in the same way, when you go through difficult trials, you can go through anything when you know that the Lord, the Good Shepherd, is with you and when you know that He is your friend. And that leads us to the very crucial verse in this psalm. And this is what David has been building up to all this time. Look at verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, you see this isn't talking about just the temporal circumstances of our everyday lives. This isn't talking about God saving us from, from temporal circumstances. What is this talking about? This is talking about your salvation. The fact that you can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The fact that you can experience the goodness of an almighty God. The fact that you can experience the mercy of God that causes your sins to be forgiven. Not only does the Lord provide His guidance and His protection, but here we see that God provides salvation. And because of that, you can trust Him. You see, when you got saved, the Lord didn't leave you back at salvation. In fact, when the Lord saved you, that was the beginning of His salvation work. And ever, ever since then, the Lord has been working in your life. If you're a Christian, He's been working in your life to change you, to mold you. He's been bringing circumstances into your life. He has been causing His hand to be over every circumstance of your life. So that one day, when you come out on the other side, you will be glorified. And you will stand before God, and at that moment, you will be just like Christ. And that brings God glory. Isn't that exciting? The Lord saved us, but He didn't leave us back at salvation. The work that He began, Philippians 1, 6 promises, He will complete. And so today, when you get your lens focused on the circumstances of your life, when you're stuck in traffic, and all you can, all you can see is what's over the dashboard, like we were stuck in traffic today. And you know, when, when, I, when I get stuck in traffic, often one of my biggest temptations is just to focus on the temporal. Focus on the circumstance around me. Or perhaps maybe when you get a flat tire, and, and you think, why would this happen to me on this day? Or maybe when you have a, a, a um, project coming up at work, and it's, it's piling up, and it seems so big and momentous, and you're not sure that you can get it done. Or maybe something bigger, maybe a sickness. Or maybe recently you've been diagnosed with a sickness that, that you know will never go away. And it's at those times that we can focus on the circumstance, and that we can meditate on the here and now. But David encourages us here to lift our eyes to God's amazing salvation plan. When you view your life through the lens of God's salvation, you'll realize that God is at work. He is your good shepherd and guides. He is your good shepherd and protects. And not only that, but it reminds us of John chapter 10 when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He saves us. And so today, if you are a Christian, then you must focus on these truths. Because we can't trust the Lord if we're focused on the temporal circumstances of our lives. We can't trust the Lord if we continue to meditate on the same thing again and again. It's impossible. So first of all, we have to ask God, we have to say, God, I need help to trust you tonight. And then we must choose to focus on these truths. Every time we are tempted to worry and to focus on the temporal circumstances, we must focus on the fact that God is our guide, He is our protector, and He is our Savior. And as Matt Templeton lay on his hospital bed in Germany, he began to meditate on Psalm 23, just like we looked at it tonight. And he began to look through and see all the things that God provided for him. And even though he continues, even to this day, to struggle with some, some physical problems that came because of that explosion, Matt has learned to trust the Lord. And you know, today, no matter what God has brought into your life, you too can trust the Lord. So let's pray, and let's ask the Father for grace to trust Him. Father, we know that we cannot do this on our own. 
We know that by ourselves, we are sheep that go astray. We turn to our own wicked way. Yet we pray that tonight you would give us grace to trust you. And that you would give us grace, even in the middle of difficult circumstances, to realize that you bring those circumstances for our good. And help us, Father, to not run from under your sovereign hand. Help us not to run from you. Help us instead to embrace the trials you bring into our lives as instruments of grace. And I pray that tonight you would change us, that you would sanctify us, that you would help us to know you better through the trials that you bring into our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, 
I know this team's uh, greatest desire would be that the glory be uh, reflected to our Lord, but let's express our appreciation to them. Again, we thank you for coming. Thank all of you for coming tonight. We trust that you were blessed. And uh, I know that the Bob Jones team would be desirous of meeting with you over by their table. Uh, and then after that... Uh, for the young people and for the young at heart, we will have our Friday fun night, and we invite you to that as well. And uh, don't know of any other announcements at this time, so let's dismiss with a word of, uh, word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank thee again for uh, these young people who are dedicating their summer and their lives to serving you. Father, again, we pray that you'll give them journeying mercies as they travel. Father, that you would uh, bless their ministry and cause them to touch lives for you. Father, we pray that you will help them to grow in you as well. Lord, we ask that you will now dismiss us with thy blessing, and we thank thee for the joy of music. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>